I think I'm going forward. Ah, this is me. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Marshall Cox. Uh, I got my PhD in engineering at Columbia in 2013, so I'm a um, science-y entrepreneur. And my company is called Radiator Labs. I'm going to tell you a bit about what we do at Radiator Labs, and then I think um, I was told that you guys would be interested in hearing how I got here and a little bit about what I think is important, what I learned, what I wish I had done um, if I could start over. So no surprises, we work with radiators. Who here, just to set the scene, um, has ever lived in an apartment with a radiator? That's right. And who here has also uh, had to open the window in the middle of the winter because it was too hot in your apartment? So it's a really big problem, and it's not just New York City. It's a lot of bigger, older cities in the United States, and, and we're working to solve that. And I like to set the scene first by contrasting it with a technology you're probably pretty familiar with. Uh, this is Alexander Graham Bell, and as most of us know, if not all of us, he invented the telephone. And so it's really interesting to think about all the transitions that's gone through that, in that technology since it was invented over 100 years ago, pretty much um, the same kind of time that steam heat was invented. And clearly everyone probably here has one, if not two, supercomputers in their pocket, which is a you know, wireless cell phone. Um, and the changes from the harmonic telegraph to today is, are out outrageous. Just so much change. And contrast that to radiators. This is actually Alexander Graham Bell standing next to a steam radiator. <laughs> and I promise you that if this building is still there, that radiator is still there completely untouched. Um, so think about that. A lot of these buildings built 100 year, years ago, same heat system, unmodified, still working, which is amazing, but still um, no changes uh, to speak about, really. And that's a big problem. This is our market slide. So a lot of buildings in the United States have radiators for heat, and a lot of them are steam radiators. Uh, probably about 15% of the US and about 8% are steam. And that's a big problem because steam is hugely wasteful. The Department of Energy estimates we waste 30%. So 30% of the fuel a building consumes is wasted. And that is, turns out, when you do the calculation, to be an outrageous amount of waste. So it's about $7 billion a year in fuel that you can imagine burning in the streets. Um, it's 40 billion pounds of CO2, which is about 4 million cars. Um, and that's just the waste. And um, I'll get into it a little more a little bit later, but the fuel you consume in your building is, is combusted at your building and you breathe it in. So it's actually a really big um, problem for uh, health. So we have a solution. I'm not going to go into too much depth here. I'll be at the, the coffee break so I can go into a lot more detail, more than you would ever want, if you'd like. But we make this little cover. It's pretty simple. Um, it's an insulating cover with a thermostatically controlled fan. And by using this system around the radiator, we can manipulate the thermodynamics of the steam system and actually push energy from hot rooms to cold rooms. This is the picture of our newest prototype. This is my apartment, which doesn't usually look this nice. But we're really proud of it. We designed it specifically to look like a radiator cover so some, of the, some people don't get kind of weirded out by it. Um, but it works really well. And again, not going into too much detail, but how it works is we stop overheating in hot rooms. That turns out to push heat more efficiently to cold rooms. And then those cold rooms heat up faster, and we turn the boiler off sooner. And that's how we save energy. We've shown savings of between 30 and 40%. So it actually does reclaim all of that um, lost efficiency. Really important to note here is that, and this is kind of gets to the social aspect of what we're doing, that in these apartments that we're talking about, no one has ever been able to control the temperature in their apartment in the history of the building. So these are people that, for one reason or other, are living in a home where they're pretty much miserable constantly. And that's outrageous. So when we install these things, everything's wirelessly connected to the cloud. We give them control with their cell phone, which everyone loves. Um, and it makes people, you know, it empowers them to, to actually live in a home where they can uh, be master of more than just paying the bill. Um, this is a results slide, and not to, not to boast, but <laughs> we do see the savings that, that we talk about. But I really wanted to point out one thing here, which is the um, PM 2.5. Uh, many of you may not be familiar with that. This is particular matter 2.5. This is 2.5 micron small carbon um, emissions. And this is what they talk about when they talk about pollution that kills people. So again, when you combust fuel in your building, you're breathing in those combustion fuels. Um, contrast that with electricity, which is produced maybe 100 miles away, uh, and you're not breathing in that air. This stuff is, is burned in your building. It's oil. It's sometimes number two oil, which is or number six oil, which is horrible. And we can reduce the emissions from this stuff by a dramatic amount, not just the 30% that we save, by using more advanced um, heating algorithms. We can consolidate boiler cycles and actually reduce the pollution by 50%. So we make a huge difference here in, in the air that we breathe. Um, that's kind of all I want to talk about with the company. And, and obviously, our path forward is, is we want to give people control in, the, in their apartments for the first time. Uh, we want to reduce the pollution that, that we breathe every day. Um, by the way, you know that black soot on your windowsill? That's all from boilers in the city. That's where that stuff comes from. That's the, the small particular matter. Um, we want to save a lot of, of, of money. And this is actually hugely important because uh, you can have the best technology, but if it's not affordable, it doesn't make financial sense. It's not going to, to affect change. 
Um, and then, of course, you want to bring all these things online. So uh, a lot of people talk about the Internet of Things. It's kind of annoyingly overused. But when you bring things like radiators online uh, in, in buildings, you start to gather a lot of data that no one's ever had before. And we can use this data to great effects. For instance, figuring out where in, in a 100-year-old you know, building, what are the worst actors in the building? Why are these four apartments losing heat way faster than everybody else? And you can start to do a lot of analytical um, figuring out of what changes you can make in addition to fixing that infrastructural heating system. Um, this is the team. I just want to talk about this really quickly. Everyone in my company is awesome, um, <laughs> obviously. And, uh, and then I want to transition into like, how do I got here? And I hope this is useful for you or interesting. Um, so my PhD is in, in engineering, and it's, um, my specialty is organic electronics. So OLED TVs, if you've ever heard of those, OLEDs is, is organic lighting and dials. It's basically what I worked on for the past 15 years. Um, so how on earth did I start working with radiators? Um, real simple answer. Uh, I lived in an unmitigated hellhole of an apartment. It was <laughs> ridiculous and, and basically complained uh, incessantly to my advisor, who um, is entrepreneurial and helped me figure out a way to, to solve this problem. And um, a lot of people have, solved, have tried to solve this problem via plumbing. We're not plumbers. We didn't think of it like that. We came up with, with I think, what was an innovative solution that actually works really well and has a number of advantages. Um, so obviously, important here was that I was a tinkerer, and I built this thing on my own. But how do you get from, OK, I've made this weird bubble wrap thing in my apartment that works to, you know, here's a company and, and take me seriously? And the first step for me was uh, what I think a lot of you realize, which is business plan competitions. You need money. And business plan competitions were huge for us. We were able to try out the pitch, refine it, actually get a message that, that um, resonated with people, and then win money, in many cases, to develop a first real version of the product. So that was a big um, part of our path. Um, the next is, you know, you have this technology, who in their right mind is going to install it in their building? And for that first customer, Columbia was great, because you know, they have a lot of buildings, there's a lot of resources there, there's a lot of people who want you to succeed at Columbia. So that was really important for us. And then, of course, um, you know, reaching out to your entrepreneurial communities, um, if you're in fellowships, et cetera, that's, that's how you get the word out, and that's how you get connected to the people who care about what you're doing. Um, and then how do you gain notoriety? This is important for us, too. And, and here, I think the, the key factor is being passionate about what you're doing. And I'll get to that in, in the lessons learned next. Um, but you really have to be passionate about what you're doing, and then that passion is contagious. And you can talk to people who are also passionate, and they'll talk to like popular science and stuff like that. Um, so that's how we gained uh, kind of uh, people got to know us. Um, so this is what I would have done if I had started over again. Hopefully this is useful. I kind of feel embarrassed talking about this. But um, the really important thing that I've learned is that the idea isn't the hard part. Um, it's, it, there's a lot of things out there that can, that can be improved, like everywhere. Um, I just found inspiration in that horrible piece of metal in my apartment. Um, there's tons of things out there like that. And the important thing is not the idea, but to be passionate about it. Again, um, hugely important. If you're passionate about it, that's going to not only you know, be contagious and everyone's going to love what you're doing, um, but it's also super important to weather the storm that is coming. Winter is always coming when you have a startup company. <laughs> and, and you have to be able to, to ride through those, those down times because they happen all the time. Um, I wish I found a co-founder that was full-time. That's like the biggest thing, the biggest regret I have. I have two co-founders. One's a professor, not going to quit his job. The other um, just didn't want to be a, a, a startup guy. So I was alone for years, and it was horrible. And I finally brought on a new um, COO who's like a co-founder level, and he's great. And it's changed my entire life. But if you do anything, find somebody who's, who's complementary to your skill set. Go and meet an engineer or whatever, um, and who's also passionate about the idea, because it, it makes a world of difference. Not, it's not just 2x you know, the capability. It's, it's like 3, 4, 5x. Um, and then, this is obvious, but a lot of people overlook it. It's crazy. But customer discovery is huge. So what we did is we, we went to Columbia. We started building it to Columbia. And we worked to exactly what they wanted. And they had the very specific means. This is kind of weird, but Columbia has a, like a 20-year view. Like most buildings are like, OK, do I have enough money for next year? Columbia is like, are the students in my housing going to donate to Columbia in 20 years? That's what they care about. So they care about comfort. And so we, we <laughs> built to comfort at first. And then as you, you do that and you find new customers, you add them in, eventually you're, you're building your product to the market, because now you know, 20 customers is the market. Um, so making sure you have uh, product market fit, obviously, it's super important. Um, and, but some people do overlook it. It's crazy. And the last thing is uh, just stay strong. Again, entrepreneurship, if you're going to do this, it, it is crazy how many ups and downs there are. Um, it's, it's outrageous. People told me this a long time ago. I was like, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be fine. But it is really hard sometimes. But it's always, there's always like the, the next day, and it works out. So if that ever happens to you, don't worry. It gets better. And I find <clears throat> a lot of inspiration in my team. To, um, to, to bridge those, those downtimes. 
because um, they're awesome. And obviously, surrounding yourself with really, really awesome and, and capable and, and strong people um, is going to be the best thing you can do to, to, to be successful. And that's really it. Thanks. Thanks.